Hello everyone. This is the video tutorial for lab 12. So in this lab, we will be doing the two tasks. Uh, so this lab is an extension of lab 11. So in lab 11, we created an AXI peripheral in which we computed a queue function and we packaged an IP. Now our task is to integrate that IP in our design and do a sort of hardware software code design. So in the very first lab of the Zinc, what we have done is we have calculated the floating point uh, functions and we calculated it using the PS that is your processing system zinc processing system and specifically uh, I should say the arm processor using the arm processor we create uh, we calculated the value of the Q function now in the last lab we calculated the value of the uh, calc we wrote an IP to calculate the Q function so in this lab what we will do is we will integrate both of this so Earlier, uh, till last lab, what we did uh, is we only included the PS part of the Zing and we have not done anything on the PL part. That is, we have not put anything on the FPGA part. So in this lab, we will put the IP on the FPGA part and the PS will all, uh, also be there. And in the SDK, what we will do is we will calculate the Q function using the PS and then we will calculate the Q function using the FPGA. And then we will compare the results whether it is correct or not. So there will be slight changes in the block design and everything that we will look into. So let's get started and first let's create the hardware for our project. For that we will be using the wave auto as usual. Right. Let's see. Okay, so first let's create a new project. We don't need to specify sources at this time. Okay, so let's create a block design. I am naming it as lab 12 block design. All right, so the very first part is to add the zinc processing system. So earlier what we used to do is we used to customize this sync IP because we didn't need the PL part of it. So all these ports, the master XI GP0 port and the clock to, uh, to uh, clock to the FPGA and the reset to the FPGA, these were not needed. So earlier we used to uh, remove all these things. But in this case, because we were using the PL as well or the FPGA as well, so these things will be needed, right? So let's first run the block automation. So this is a mandatory step that you should always do because in, in, in using this, you can uh, automate most of the things inside, right? All right. So one thing that you need to do in this particular lab is to change the PL frequency. So first let's go to the clock configuration. And as you can see, the PL fabric clock is by default 50 megahertz. So, so you have to change it to 10 megahertz. So the reason being, so we tried and tested it. So what actually happened when we were synthesizing using the 50 megahertz and you can also try it your end. So keep it as the 50 megahertz and try to synthesize the design. So once you synthesize the design and you, once you generate the bit stream, so what you will see is the implement the implemented design has a negative slack, right? So from the negative slack, whatever the negative slack we were getting, that simply means that the clock period is not sufficient for that, right? Whatever clock you are using is not sufficient to complete the operation, to schedule the operation. So that's why we are getting a negative uh, slack. I think we discussed this uh, slack uh, and everything and the, and the timing constraints in the pipelining lab, in which we talked about the setup time and hold time. 
so they there so if you if you synthesize it using the 50 megahertz clock that is the default clock you will get the negative slack and you can verify it your end as well we have already tried and tested this thing so what actually happens is when once you get the negative slack that means that much minimum clock periods needs to be extended so once you increase the clock period so your definitely your clock frequency will go for a toss right it will go low so from 50 uh, so if you add the exact uh, slack whatever you are getting you will see your clock frequency the clock frequency at which your this design can work will come around 14 megahertz or in some case you can like it's it's it's, it's a bit uh, you know uh, will come between 10 to 14 so i'm taking the lower limit here although we can take till the higher limit but it's also fine for time being so i'm taking the 10 megahertz in, in, in so that i can get a positive slack right so that change you need to do first all right now the next part is to add our custom ip that we designed so for that we uh, if you if you look into if you go into the add and if you search for your ip you will probably not find your ip like in, in my case if i am writing this I, I can find my this q function ip that is the name of the ip which i made uh, so for you this may not be the case you can you will not find it for the first time because you have not defined your the path to your ip repository so in order to define the path for the ip repository uh, what you need to do is we have to go to the settings and go to the ip defaults so as you can see here so in uh, in my case this is my working directory where i may call the projects so and and in this working directory uh, there is this one folder which is called as ip underscore repo so what uh, what you uh, what i will suggest you to just select the top folder in which you create the projects uh, and add it like using this add button you can just simply add the particular like if i go into eld labs so i can simply add this directory to my ip path which i have already added so once you have added the directory what uh, one essential step that you need to do is you have to apply the settings right so before apply, without applying it will not be reflected so you have to apply the settings and you have to close the vivado and open it again this is the need as you can see here your default repository path will be applied only at the new project creation so it's fine if whatever you have created you can either save it and uh, you can uh, you can you don't save it you can start from the beginning as well that's not a big issue but uh, the thing is you have to close it once in order to get these path reflected for your default repositories right so for my case i've already added so i can clearly see if i go to the uh, plus button i can clearly see my ip right so once i select the ip I can run the connection automation. So as you can see, there are multi, uh, there are slave ports, there are clock to be connected for the PL part of it, and there is a reset signal that needs to be connected to the IP. So all these things, although you can also draw these things, you can connect it, but I will still recommend you run the connection automation. It is always recommended because the margin of error is very less in this case. In fact, close to negligible, right? So you can just click on, okay, that's fine. All right, so once you have created uh, the IP, so if you can see that it's not fitting into the picture, into the my complete window, so you will, you can regenerate the layout. Using this, you can regenerate the layout. Now let's see what's actually happening here. So there is your zinc PS and there is your Q function IP. So if I categorize it, so your zinc is your general purpose processor. And this IP will be implemented on the FPG, right? Then what is this AXI peripheral is doing here? Because there is zinc, I, uh, there is zinc, there is a, there are master ports and there is slave port. Why didn't we connect directly to it to them, right? So what actually happens is the protocols. So the zinc seven processing system, the protocol which is uh, which is being used by a processing system is different from the pro protocol which is uh, being used in the FPGA, right? So 
the one of the task of the, this exa peripheral is to connect devices which are which are using different exa protocols as well so protocol transformation is also there so this is whenever you connect whenever you connect anything on the fpga and then you make a connection between the ps and pl so exa peripheral will always be there so that's why it is here as you can see uh, your master port is connected here to the slave port and then the master port of the exa peripheral is connected to the slave port so these connections are fine. The clock and reset are given from here, right? So that is all about the comp uh, that the design. So we have got our IP here. We have got the processing system here. We have a say reset here, and this is the reset logic. So for timing, you can uh, ignore this, but yeah, this is this provide the reset a processor system reset this complete block. So now next thing is the three essential step we always do. So the first thing is to validate the design. So you will get these four warnings and you can ignore, ignore this point. Warning is not very uh, much critical for our project. All the certain critical warning messages, but it's not quite critical for our project purpose. It's the board. If you, if you, if you go move on to some another board, let's say Z board, uh, you will not get these points. So that's Zybo. This is like uh, it with the CDs will always come. And click on OK here. Uh, rest of the things looks good. The design is well validated. Next, we need to save the design. All right. Now, next thing is to generate the output products. Okay, so this will take a while. So let's wait for a while and see once it gets generated. Okay, so the output products are generated. So the next step is to create the HDL ripper and let the view auto manager handle it. Okay, so once you get the HDL ripper, it's time to generate the bitstream. So this process will again take some time and after the completion we will see so till now what we have seen that uh, in the implemented design only the ps uh, the pl part was completely empty there was nothing got mapped onto the pl there was no routing everything was empty so let's see if if something gets mapped onto the pl this time because we are using this uh, q function used to be ip so there are floating point ips which is uh, which will be mapped to the fpg so let's wait for this uh, bitstream generation to complete and then we'll look into uh, whether these gets mapped or not. All right, the bitstream generation is completed. Now let's look into the design and see. So as you can see here, uh, the first negative slack is coming out to be 20.422, right? So you can get an idea like when we are using 10 megahertz clock fre uh, PL frequency, we are getting this much slack. So now you can, you must be having some idea like when we use, when we, if we use 50 megahertz, it will definitely go to some negative slack. That means the timing closure will never be met in at 50 megahertz. So why this is happening? So the code, what we have written in this queue function, we have instantiated those many IP and everything. So there are the paths that which are taking place are some long paths, which are not getting covered in that, in the one, in, in the one clock period. If we are, if we are giving that much, uh, TL frequency, right? So one more thing that I want to show you is to see the implemented design. Okay. okay so if I open the synthesized design, uh, let's see if there is something on the PL part this time or not.
Okay, so we have not opened the implemented design. So let me open the implemented design. Okay, so the last time we opened the synthesized design, but not the implemented design. So if we, if you want to open the implemented design, you can uh, click here, open implemented design. Yeah. So now you see there is a lot of congestion in this area of the PL, which was earlier free when we started when the when we were only using the PS part. So now let's look into it. So there are multiple blocks which are mapped here. As you can see, there is a dense kind of routing. So just to implement this queue function, uh, so as you can see, almost 25% to like 20 to 25% of your FPGA is taken, right? So that is this floating point operations take the this much area of the FPGA that you can intuitively say from here. And yeah, so these all these things are routing and everything. So yeah, so that means uh, this time we have something on the PS side and then we have something on the PL side as well. So our mapping is there. That's what I wanted to show you. All right, this is fine. Also, you can see the timing here that we earlier also looked into. Right, so that's also fine. So we have a positive uh, slack. So that means for we can still increase or uh, decrease our clock period by it's 20 not not the exact value but around this like about 19 nanosecond or so so that you can also do so your maximum operating frequency will come around 13 or 14 megahertz right and then you can also see the power how much power it is taking right dynamic power and static power everything you can see here and in the design run, you can see the synthesis is completed without any error. Implementation is completed without any error, right? It's fine. All right. So now we can close the implemented design. All right. The next thing is to export the hardware. This time we have to include the bitstream because two things needs to be done for the programming of the FPGA bitstream is needed for the programming of the processor that is a PS part. We need an ELF file or we can call it as an application file. So two different things are there. So we need to include the bitstream this time. Okay. So while uh, what is the uh, like when when you include the bitstream so you can program the FPGA from directly from the SDK as well. And if you include the bitstream, like, oh, it's not a uh, part of the part of the course. But if you make some, uh, like, if you want to put your application and everything, whatever you have designed, and on a, on a memory card or on a flash flash, uh, so you can use, uh, you can package everything in the SDK. So it it becomes essential to include the bitstream whenever the PS PL is included in your design. So click on OK. It's fine and then you can launch the SDK. So this was the part one of the lab where we have to make the block, where we, where we were asked to make the block uh, design with the PS and PL both. So we have made it and we have also verified the timing closure is met and we can see that the RIP is getting mapped onto the FPG. Right, so that's all for the part one of this lab. And in the next video, we will discuss about the part two. Thank you very much.